We finish today this series that we've entitled Mission Possible. We're at the start of the school year, which tends to coincide with the start of a lot of church activities and events and emphases. We've returned to some of the most important things that we as a church are trying to do together. And remember that there are several good reasons why that's true. One of them is very simply that, just like for individual human beings, it is very easy for groups like this to forget what's most important to them, why they exist, and what they should do. There's a story I heard when I was in graduate school the president of our graduate school was meeting with those of us who were part of the chaplain's department, and he was relaying this story to us. He said he was asked to be part of the board of directors of a very large Christian nonprofit group that had been around for 120 years. And at his first meeting of that board, they got together. And the board was talking about specific details in the organization that they needed to handle. They were arguing about what specific things or events they needed to do next. They even argued a little bit about which positions they needed to hire next as a part of their staff. And the president of our graduate school said, after about Oh, 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour of that. He just couldn't take it anymore. And he just blurted out in the middle of that board meeting, would somebody please tell me why you guys exist? And all he got were some stammered answers that came right out of the organizational brochure that you hand people when you're trying to fundraise. He got a lot of silence and a lot of stares. And based on those very half-hearted, half-witted answers, the president of my graduate school stood up at that board meeting and said, here's my advice to you. You guys need to stop. You need to quit. You need to close this organization because you've completely forgotten why you exist. And he left. And he didn't serve another day on that board. I wonder how many churches shouldn't have somebody with the courage to tell them, you either get back on mission or you need to quit. You need to stop, because this isn't working. This is what we've talked about so far. We've talked about how we as a church, it may in fact be the single greatest discernible way that you can see God at work in our midst. We are becoming more and more a church that takes very seriously Jesus' second great command to love our neighbors, most of whom are not here this morning. They live around you in your work world or in your neighborhood. We are going to love them the way that we ourselves wish that we could be loved. And this is possible. You can do this. It just takes the will to do it. Then we talked about being God's ecclesia. That's the Bible word for church. Being people who will live distinct by a different set of rules in the world. This too is possible. And last week we talked about the second R in our three R's that we say define who we are. And that is that all of us will be very intentional and deliberate about living spiritually rooted lives. That is far more than what we do here on Sunday morning. And this too is possible if we just give it the energy and effort and attention that it deserves. I want to end this series by talking about some expressions that you, like I, no doubt, have heard a lot. In the last 15 to 20 years as an American in American culture. Odds are that at some point, if a 20-something or a 25-year-old asks someone for their advice about what on earth I should do with my life, they are going to be told something that sounds a lot like one of those two phrases on the screen. You need to follow your dreams. You need to follow 
your passions? What do you really, really intensely care about as a person? That's what you need to do with the rest of your life. If you have a teenager, you may well have had a conversation with your teenager as they consider what they're going to do after graduation day that sounds a lot like you need to follow your dreams, you need to follow your passion. Would you say with me that this is an idea that has ingrained itself so much into our culture that nobody even questions it anymore? We take it to be from the mouth of God himself as if, as if Moses were on Mount Sinai in 2012 and God gave him an 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment was, follow your dreams, follow your passion. And by the way, in groups like ours, you hear the same kind of thing talked about. You hear the same kind of thing taken as holy writ. So that groups of people or churches should follow their vision for themselves. That they should find who they are unlike anybody else and they should go after that with great fervor and intensity. There's merit to those two expressions on the screen, allow me to offer you a biblical critique of those two expressions this morning. And as I do, I hope to give you a better way to consider what you will use your life on, what your dreams and passions really should be, and how perhaps we can engage your sacred imagination for yourself and for us as a group in a different way. Here's part of a biblical critique of those two ideas. The single most problematic word in either of those phrases is the word your. Because how trustworthy is the word your? Tell you what, for those of you who are my age or thereabouts or older, which is early 40s, um, I'd like you to remember, if you can, without the help of supplements, um, what you thought, what you thought your dreams were, or passions were 20 years ago. Do you remember any of them? Can you blow the dust off of them and look at them for me and tell me what they are? How many of them are you doing today? Does that mean you're a failure if it's not many? How accurately do you think you are able to assess what your real dreams or your true passions are? I think only the young think they're really good at it. And the older you get, the more you realize that my own view of what my dreams or passions should be are actually fairly skewed, fairly warped, and worst of all, they're pretty selfish because they involve a lot of me and not a lot of other people. Would you admit that with me? Here's adding on to that. When the Bible, and it does, use the word passion, um, more often than not, it's not a good thing. The Bible uses the word passions or those deep intensities of human nature and more often than not, not all the time, more often than not, they are things that you need to be freed from. How many of the passions or dreams of the people inside our culture are nothing more than the worst manifestations of human nature? And that they think they're following after the greatest dreams of their imagination and really all they're following after is what the Bible would call the most perverse, most selfish, self-centered dreams of human nature. This is the problem with those two expressions. So I'd like to give you another expression this morning, that as a Christian person or as a person considering Jesus and the whole Christian thing is a far better phrase for you to orient your life around and for us as a church to orient our church around. It is not either of those phrases. It is this phrase. What does God want? 
And the Bible itself uses an expression that we could translate into English, what God wants all the time. In fact, in your New Testament alone, it uses this expression over a hundred times. In the language of the New Testament, which is ancient Greek, it's the word "thelo" or "theleo" or "thelemati" or "thelemos." You know that expression as God's will. Here's the problem with that translation of that idea. Many of us in 2012, especially those of us who grew up in the church, hear a phrase like God's will, and we think it means, well, whatever God wants to have happen actually happens. And I assure you that is a philosophical question that is far too big for us to handle in the span of 30 minutes this morning. Somebody asked me during the summer, and what's up with that? I would gladly handle that question. The thing you need to know this morning is most of the time when you see that phrase in your Bible, God's will, that is not what it means. It does not mean that God chooses something and makes it, come hell or high water, high water happen. Most of the time when you see the phrase God's will, it means this. It means what God wants to happen. What God wishes for his people. What God, if you will, dreams. What his passions are for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus. So let me see this morning if I can replace for us and for you the idea of following our own dreams and passions with a far better, far more biblical idea, which is to do what God wants. Let me break it down this morning into three broad categories. If you were to look up these hundred plus uses of the idea of God's will, you would find they would fall into these three categories. Number one, from the beginning of a small letter that Paul wrote somewhere around 50 A.D. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age. And here's the phrase, according to the wishes of God our Father. What's that tell you about what God wants for every single one of us, regardless of who we are, what our age is, or what our education level is? God wants this. He wants all of us to be free from what Paul calls the present evil age. What I will call on the screen the broken, warped, and dying world in which every single one of us lives. This is what God hopes for all of us. J.R. Tolkien, the writer of The Hobbit and the Three Lord of the Rings books, was once asked by a British newspaperman, you know, it seems like these years, these decades that you spent writing these elaborate books about a world that never existed, going as far as to invent, invent entire languages that never existed before for the races of Middle-earth to speak in your books. It seems like a monumental waste of time. J.R.R. Tolkien said back to that man, would you tell a prisoner that it's a waste of time dream of freedom my books are dreams of freedom this is what God wishes for you and for me I don't care what your vocation is I don't care what your vocational aspirations are I don't care if you're going back to school to relearn a new trade at the age of 45 what I do know is that God wants every one of us to be free from what Paul calls this present evil age. We live in a culture that is broken, warped, and dying, to use my, my words from the screen. And God wants you to be free from that. And part of what we're pursuing here together is a different way of life. A way of life that perhaps the culture around us would look at and not understand. They might even disagree with. They might even say to us, you guys are flat out wrong. 
And we would say back to them, I understand that you don't get it, but I'll follow Jesus anyway. This is what we're trying to do. Let me narrow that down for you a little bit. Listen to these two verses that deal with God's wants or wishes in the same way, but they just get a little more specific about the evil present age in which we live. This is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2, in which St. Peter writes, You Christians need to live the rest of your earthly lives no longer according to your human desires. There's that word passions, by the way. No longer according to your human desires, but instead according to the will or wishes of God. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Here is the will or wishes of God, that you should be growing more and more distinct or holy. Namely, you should abstain from all sexual sin. Each one of you needs to know how to control your own body in holiness and honor. What are Paul and Peter driving at? When you talk about freedom, that what God wants is a distinct people who live distinctly in the world, you have to recognize that a great part of what you and I are trying to be freed from is ourselves. The worst of our own human nature. This is what God wants. This is what God hopes. These are frankly far more important and far more fundamental than most of the things that pass for dreams and passions in our day. So, if you're listening this morning, you should ask yourself, I wonder, what are the human desires from which God wants me to be free? And as a Christian person, you should always have an idea of what God is trying to free you from right now. And it is not just as big or as tabloid as addiction or materialism. These are the things we tend to talk about. Let me mention some of the more subtle, more ingrained human desires that are equally warped with those things. Anxiety and worry. These are things that we can be freed from. Control of our own life and of the others around us are things that we can be freed from. Not believing that God will take care of what our family needs if we just seek first His kingdom as Jesus said. These are things from which we need to be freed. You are not the captain, captain of your life's ship if you understand Christianity correctly. No, you're a passenger. This is a human desire from which you need to be freed. When you observe the lives around you, the lives of the broken and hurting people in our world, what are the things in their lives that you observe that then you say to yourself, I myself need to be freed from that? This is what God wants. This is what God wishes. And we as a church, by the way, if we were taking our marching orders from the Bible and from nothing else, we would say that we exist to do this very same thing. That we exist to be a place where you can do this and you can do this with others and then we offer the opportunity to other people to come in and join us in that process. To be freed. To live different. And to be better than human. Here's the second category. of how the Bible answers the question of what God wants, which is for a Christian a far better question than what your dreams or passions are. 
And to do it, I want to show you a bunch of verses that are going to look really, really the same. And that's the point. All of these are written by Paul. And at the front end of so many of his letters, he says this about himself. I am Paul, called to be an apostle or a messenger of Christ Jesus by, there's our phrase, the will or wishes of God. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. It's a little redundant, don't you think? Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. The guy doesn't even change the phrase at all. It reads the same. Those letters, by the way, are about 10 years apart. And over and over and over, he says the same thing. What's his point? His point is this. That for the great Apostle Paul, who was the engine behind the growth of Christianity 2,000 years ago, he had the sense that his life was hand-picked by God to do something extraordinary for God in the world. In his case, it was to be an apostle, to plant churches, to risk his life, to travel around the Mediterranean world. This is how he viewed himself. Now, here's the thing. Paul and other Christians are going to use the same language about all Christian people. For instance, Christians are called to be God's distinct holy people in the world, Romans 1.7 says. And Christian people, regardless of race, ethnicity, religious background, economic background, all kinds of categories of Christian people are equally called to be that, we are told. That's from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We are called to be connected to Jesus. We are called to be freed, to love, and to serve each other. And we are called to be unified together as the community of Christ. My point to you is this. It's abundantly misleading of Paul to use the phrase about himself and then use it about us if he doesn't mean the same thing. So the point to us is this. What does God want? Well, based on that set of verses and the idea of God's will being to call us, it means this, that God wants specifically, particularly you. He wants exactly what you are, exactly at this time, to do very specific, particular things. This is how Paul felt about himself. He knew who he was, and he knew exactly what he himself should be doing for God's work in the world. And we as Christian people are equally called by God's will. It's what God wants. Stop thinking about perhaps what God wants other Christian people to do, or the specific ways that he wants other Christian people to serve, or the specific places where he wants other Christian people to live, or the other specific places that he wants other Christian people to go to church. And you need to start thinking about you, specific, particular you. And you need to catch a sense of what God wants you to do right here, right now. Let me give you some phrases to think about as you mull over how you, specific, particular you, are being called by God to do something specific that nobody else can do. This is the sense that Paul had of himself. This is what God wants for you. These are some phrases that come to us, some sentences that come to us from one of our generation's greatest Christian writers, a man named Frederick Buechner, who's now in his 80s. See if these three short paragraphs get at what Paul means and how it defines what God wants or wishes for all of us. First, Frederick Buechner writes, you need to go, as a Christian person, you need to go where your best prayers lead you. You need to do what your best prayers tell you to do. We pray every week that we gather together as a church. Oftentimes we will use old 
prayers to do it. Or we will use prayers from other parts of the globe that get us outside of our American Christian setting. When we pray those things, how is your imagination sparked for what you could do for somebody else or for God's kingdom in the world? Frederick Buechner's right. You need to listen to those instinctual spiritual responses that you have, and you need to do them. You, are, you can entrust yourself, if nothing else in your life, entrust yourself to the responses that you have when you pray. Listen and have the courage to obey. This is what God wants for you. Here's the second selection from Frederick Buechner. The life I touch for good or for ill will touch someone else's life. And that life will in turn touch another. And that one in turn will touch another. Until who knows where the trembling stops or starts. And how far my touch will actually be felt. This is the genius behind Jesus' command to love your neighbor, by the way. He doesn't say, go love somebody across the face of the planet in a culture that you do not know. There's nothing wrong with that if you do it, but if you skip over loving your neighbor, you miss the ripple effect of love. If I intensely, purposely love the people nearest to me, then they will do the same to somebody else. And God is calling upon all Christian people to do this. Particularly, specifically you, in your particular, specific setting, to the particular, specific people in which, around which, with which you live. This is what God wants. He wants you to find ways to touch their life in love so that they in turn will let loose the ripple effect of love. And last, Frederick Buechner writes in a phrase that you can find in so many books because it is so well written. He writes this to a friend of his who is struggling to know what they should do with their life and his advice is brilliant. He says very simply that you need to know the place God calls you is the place where you feel the deepest gladness and it's the place of the world's greatest hunger you want to know what to do you want to know what god is asking you specifically you to do you need to figure out two things what makes you the most glad what makes you the most happy or joyous and where is the world around you the most hungry and where those two places meet that's what God wants you to do. And this is not about your job. This is bigger than your job. This is not about whether or not you retire in two years. It's bigger than that. This is not about where you live or what education you have. It's bigger than that. But God, like he was Paul, is calling every Christian person to find out what they specifically and particularly can do what they should do. And this is what we want for you. We want everyone to have an answer to what makes you the most glad and where does the world need that the most. We want to turn you loose to do that. And ironically enough, here's the third category that answers the question of what God wants, which is the biblical way of saying what your passions or your dreams should be as a Christian person. This is the place that you see it the most clearly in the Bible, though you can find it all over the place. This is written by Jesus' half-brother, James, in the first letter of your New Testament. James writes to these Christian people, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a morning mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, 
if the Lord wishes. If it's what God wants, we will live and do this or that. What does God want? Well, God wants you to entrust Him with all the unknowns that are far too big for you or far too away for you. Here's another problem with those phrases, follow your passions or follow your dreams. And for that to be the central advice that we give people when they're considering about making a life change or what direction to head, they're focused in the wrong place. Those questions, follow your dreams, follow your passions, where are they focused? They're focused on the future. i got news for you. The future is far too big for anybody in the room. Anybody. From a biblical perspective. And it is only human hubris that thinks we can make plans today that therefore somehow the universe and God himself are obligated to follow through on tomorrow and next month and next year. No. This is not how it works. The danger, one of the dangers of thinking I need to follow my passions or follow my dreams is it pulls your attention away from the single most important moment of your life which is today. Today. James says to those Christian people, look, it's okay if you make a business plan to go someplace for a year, to go to such and such a town, that's fantastic. It is the monumentally dumbest thing for you to do, to wrap your entire life around future plans that you have absolutely no control over. How many people do you know who live in constant frustration, if not despair, because their lives are wound around those kinds of future plans that they cannot control. And they are constantly befuddled when they do not come true. The biblical perspective is stop. That is too big for anybody in the room. Stop. What God wants is for you to pay attention to today. His will for you His dreams and passions and hopes for you, many of them have to do with only one 24-hour period today. And if you don't care what they are for you today, I'm not real sure that you're going to care what they are for you tomorrow. Get on board with today, and God will take care of tomorrow. What does God want from you today? When you go home today, what does he want from you, for you? What does he want to do through you? This is what matters most. Stop looking around the corner. Stop looking too far ahead. Do it today. Those things we've already talked about, He wants you to be free from the world around you and to live according to the the beat of an entirely different drummer. He wants you to be freed from the things that are the worst about you. He wants you to find out specifically, particularly who you are and the the specific, particular things He wants you to do right now. Guess what? All that stuff, He wants you to do it today. Not tomorrow, not next week. He wants you to do it today. Our attention should be on today. Let God's attention be on everything else. Everything else. If we were wise as a church family, we would keep that in mind too. You focus on today. Being obedient to the things that you know to do today. Caring about the things you know we are trying to care about today. We cannot guarantee tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow or the next year holds. We simply obey today. Let me review for you. If you make the trade that I am suggesting this morning, you will loosen your grip on the idea of following your dreams or following your passions And you will begin to replace those questions that are not completely imperfect but deeply flawed with this far better 
question. What does God want? He wants you to dream of being freed from the worst of the world around you, and yes, even yourself. And He wants you to dream of being specifically and particularly you, right in the setting in which you live, for His sake, like Paul was so long ago. And He wants you to dream of not holding the reins of your life so tightly and certainly not looking too far ahead or having your life be all about tomorrow when it should be all about today. I want to give you some time to uh, process with God this exchange that I am proposing for you today. From thinking about passions and dreams to simply thinking about what God wants for your life and for my life and for our life together. Scattered around today are some uh, tan colored half sheets. And there are two different kinds and you'll know that by what's on top, the title of the sheets. Grab one of the ones that's close to you. Doesn't matter if it has 4U or 4RT on top. And what I would like you to do for the next three minutes while the music plays, is that I want you to give God the opportunity to realign your life from what you thought you really cared about to what He might want for you, if you have one of those sheets, or for us, if you have one of the sheets for River Tree. And what I'm going to ask you to do if you have one of the sheets for River Tree is I want you to write down what comes to mind And then I'm going to collect it later. Because I want to publish what all of you think after you've heard today about the phrase that's far more important, what God wants, instead of what we might dream or what our passions might be. Okay? So, text in the back. You can roll the music and you guys spend three minutes and give God the openness to talk to you about what's on those sheets.